Well, on this Memorial Day Sunday, I think it's fitting that we talk about the greatest sacrifice ever and what it means to us, our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that would do honor to our own fallen as we remember them this weekend because there's no sense of anything except in Jesus. When you see the vast fields of the fallen, there's just no sense to it, except that one day, Jesus will make all things right and will take away all that sin and bitterness and sadness and death and, and all those things that cause tears and ache and crying and will renew us by his presence forever and ever and ever in his joy and will right every wrong <clears throat> I'm not one to uh, quote people about Lincoln President Lincoln but it is said in one of the books by a pastor that he stated with his own lips. Now this is obviously hearsay because the pastor said he reported this to the pastor. So it's some historians may issue. But it is said that he declared with his own lips that he was not a Christian. He was not a Christian. I'll say it again. President Lincoln declared with his own lips he was not a Christian until even after he buried his son will he said I was not a Christian even when I buried my son will until I walked the fields of Gettysburg and according to this pastor he said to the pastor and that's when I became a Christian so death and sadness and sorrow <clears throat> can impact us and if we look to Christ we realize that it's in Christ that we have meaning and that we have opportunity for success and for joy and for hope. It's not a morbid life after all. It's a wonderful life. And even though there's death, we have great, great thanks because of Christ. Now, the message that the Lord put on my heart today I titled it, The Cross is the Path of Your Success. And although it says up on the board, Colossians 2, I'm going to maintain the tradition of my father, since we sang Faith of Our Fathers, and I'm going to begin preaching from a different passage. And then hopefully I'll tie into this. <laughs> and I say that with loving respect to my dad, <laughs> because I love the way that my dad likes to launch out in an area and then... <clears throat> Uh, at the same time, he has another vein of scripture uh, going. So, we're going to, if you could open your Bibles to John 12. And hopefully, we'll get to Colossians 2 as well. And I'm going to begin in. verse 23. And just to give a backdrop to this, this passage is considered to be one of Jesus' final sermons. Okay? Now obviously everything Jesus said it can be considered a sermon. I mean his last words, it is finished. Uh, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Those obviously have intense and deep meaning. We could spend hours and hours on those uh, words. But this is historically considered Jesus' final discourse or final sermon. Um, and it comes right on the heels of his triumphal entry in terms of chronology. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king to celebrate Passover. But he's got a different thing on his mind. He knows what's coming the next week. And he gives this message. John 12, 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, 
The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now keep in context, he just came in like a king, okay? So that connects to them immediately. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. But notice he uses the phrase, the Son of Man. Now watch that phrase as we read. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant also be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, for this cause I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people, therefore, that stood around and heard that said that it thundered. But others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but it came for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And this he said, signifying what death he should die. And then the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. And how do you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, unless darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. And these things spoke Jesus and left, and he hid himself from them. Now, interestingly, a few points quickly. If you note, he talks about at the beginning of the sermon, the Son of Man will be glorified. And then he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up as part of his glory in death. Now, the people did not all connect or think of him as the Son of Man. Maybe they started out that way. We don't know. The text doesn't actually say that they connected the fact that he came in like a king, and then he said the Son of Man must be glorified, and they thought, okay, so this must be the Son of Man. But we know from the triumphal entry that he did hear people saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they glorified him, and uh, they certainly, there were some that um, were offended by that because it clearly appeared like he was taking on God's glory. Blasphemy! He's taking on God's glory. Now, but this is the joy. Look at this. He says, <laughs> you want to know what kind of glory the Son of Man is going to have? Lift it up on a cross. And immediately they appear in the text to not connect him with that connection at all. Or at least, certainly, question, who is this Son of Man? And they go straight to the law. They whip their Bibles out. Wait a minute. Who is this Son of Man? The Bible says that he will live forever. It doesn't say he's going to die. What are you talking about? That's not right. And what does Jesus then say? doesn't directly answer their question, does he? Verse 35, he says, For a little while you will see the light. Excuse me. For a little while the light is with you. Hint. The Son of Man is right here in front of you. The light is with you a little while. 
Walk while you have the light. Lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. So he takes this and he goes directly to the fact that their assumptions about reality, about Jesus living forever, about him being king, he's coming in, and then he is going to reign in righteousness. The Son of Man is going to make all things right. He goes straight to the heart of that and says, the issue here is about your belief. Because if you don't believe in the light that you have seen in me, you're going to walk in darkness. And if you're walking in darkness, you don't even know where you're going. So the importance of walking in the light is what he focuses on. And he goes right to the heart of this. He says, look, while you have the light, believe in it, that you may be the children of light. Now I'm going to take a little side note here and say, listen, children, young people, adults, have you believed in the light? You're sitting here today in church. You've heard it all your life, maybe. But have you actually come to not obey your parents in this regard as much as obey God in this regard. You see, you can sit there, children, young people, and you can look like you're believing because your parents tell you to sit there. But until you engage your heart in belief, yourself, you're lost. You're going to hell. That's serious. So the way to walk in light is to believe. Now let's get to this primary text that I wanted to focus on. That's verse 24 and verses 24 and 25. Because I think it has some encouragement here that can help us examine what it means to make sure we're not walking where we don't know we're going. I mean, who, okay, raise your hand if you want to just like walk out the door and never know where you're going for the rest of your life. No takers? Yeah, because first of all, it's, it's like sad, right? Secondly, it's like foolish, dangerous. Like you could get hit by a car that way, right? I don't know where I'm going. You need to know where you're going. Well, the same thing is true about your life. Do you know where you're going? Adults, do you know where you're going? What are you investing in? What are we investing in? Every heartbeat is a ticking to eternity. What are we using it for? Well, look at this. This is what Jesus tells us. Verse 24 says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. I like another passage too where it says if any man want to serve me let him take up his cross and follow me this says if any man serve me let him follow me for where I am there shall my servant be if any man serve me him will my father honor do you want the path of honor do you want the path of success the path of honor and success is through dying to yourself there's no other way I heard a preacher, uh, Alistair Begg, speak to a bunch of graduates at Grove City College a week or so ago, I forget what, but anyway, I, I heard the message because I get it on my little iPod or whatever. I don't have an iPod, whatever, the I, it's on my iPhone, the app. And he said when he was 17 years old or 18 or 19, he had it all planned out. 
He was saved. He had been uh, strongly trained in the gospel. He was intellectually sound. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was going to do in life. He knew who he wanted to uh, marry, he thought at the time. He knew what career path he was going to choose. He had it all figured out. He said, so he wrote up his little facsimile, signed it at the bottom, put a space for God, and faxed it to God. And said, okay, God, I figured it out. Here's my plans. Will you kindly sign at the bottom and fax back? He said, God sent him a fax. And it said, dear son, blank. Please sign at the bottom. And he said, God took his life, turned it upside down, and he said, that the rest is history. He said, I never would have been a preacher if I hadn't surrendered. To this day, he's reaching thousands, if not millions of people preaching. How many people get that opportunity? It's one of the fastest growing worldwide preachers out there. His apps, I have trouble listening to his sermons because so many people are trying to get into his, you know, his, ah, come on, get me up. I need to get 4G or something, I don't know. All because of surrender. You see, the path to life, the path to walking in light, is a path of surrender. Now look at the words carefully here. Truly, truly, I say to you, or verily, verily, I say to you, depending on whether you have the old King James or not. What does that mean? Why would Jesus say truly twice? I mean, isn't his word sufficient? Doesn't he say, doesn't he just need to say, truly I say to you? Or how about this? Why does Jesus have to say truly at all? Isn't he truth teller? Isn't he a truth teller? Isn't he so strong in his truth that he can just say, I say to you. Kind of like a command, like a, like a military leader. Tension, I say to you. Listen up. But instead, he takes on this humble, loving form of beseeching and giving us evidence. That's what truly, truly is. It's similar to an affidavit. Whereas in a legal profession, you would, if you have to attest to what you're saying, the court puts you under oath, right? Because people talk and, and, and people can chat and people can sometimes say, well, yeah, that's the way it was, but they're not thinking seriously. And so the court says, raise your right hand and say, truly, truly. And then think about what you're saying and only tell the truth. Now we're to be truth tellers at all times in Christ. But here Jesus humbles himself to give us proof to give us evidence of his love and of his truth-telling. Wow, God didn't have to do that. God's so big and powerful, he doesn't have to humble himself to give us any proof, but he did right here. Truly, truly, I say to you, what is he promising us? What is the promise? Wow, it looks pretty bad. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you, if you fall to the ground, you die. That's the first part, right? Unless you fall to the ground, you die. It doesn't sound like a very nice promise at first until you read on, right? What is he saying? It remains alone. If you fall, if a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die, into the ground and die, it lives alone. It's all alone. A corn of wheat, in and of itself, will remain alone, will be encased in its own
pride will be encased in its own vision of life. It'll have its own facsimile of what it go is going to do with its life because it is going to maintain its hard shell around it, get its armor on, and it will do whatever it wills. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I'm going to give you a promise that if you fall to the ground and die to yourself, to your little shell, to your little vision, to your tiny little purpose in life, that little seed, you won't be alone if you do this, if you allow God to do this in you. You won't stay alone. You know, it's interesting. Um, this promise should stir us to courage. It should stir us to faith and belief. It's like Jesus when he pleads with the Jews and he says, wait a minute now. You believe in God? Come on, people. Believe in me also. You say you believe in God. And here I am. God incarnate, believe in me. That's, that's either blasphemy or he is God. And we know he is God. And so he calls us here with such tenderness and he says, fall to the ground and die so you won't be alone. You're going to be in your own little world and your own little shell and your own little vision and your own little purpose and you're going to go on through life with your little facsimile of your life and you're going to be all alone. But if you come to me, and if you die to yourself, and you surrender all, then guess what? You're not going to be alone. You're not. God sets the lonely in families. It's an interesting promise. It's also, I like the fact that this verse is a but-for test. That's another legal, logical phraseology. Because in tort law, for instance, you can't get there unless you have a but for. What that means is you cannot prove somebody committed a wrong of a tort, or what a tort means is, oh, ooh, why'd you do that to me? Okay, bodily or physical or some kind of harm, you cannot prove a tort unless you have logic that but for something somebody else did, then it wouldn't have happened to you. Well, look at this but for test. Look at this. It says, unless, it's kind of an except for test. Unless you fall to the ground, a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die, then it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So first we have the promise, very clear, giving us courage, giving us hope, and setting us not to be alone, but with each other, and setting us in the love of Christ, never to be alone, because we have Jesus first. And he sets us with his people, because no Christian is an island. We are all to be part of the body of Christ. The reason why he sets us in families is to prove that he's with us and going to bring forth fruit. And the reason why he sets families in churches is to mutually build each other up so that as we bring forth fruit, the branches are, are wide and heavy and full of fruit. And the eating is wonderful. Now, what I love about this but if or but for test that Jesus used is it proves an interesting point. First you have the affidavit of Jesus, so to speak. Verily, verily, truly, truly. Under oath is kind of how he's presenting this in a very humble form. And then he gives us logic. The logos. Do you know what the word John calls Jesus? The word Je John calls Jesus? Logos. He is the supreme logic. There is no logic apart from Jesus. If you think that in your humble mind you have any logic apart from Jesus, you've missed out on all truth. 
So we can come not only with Jesus' testimony, but he doesn't base his promise only on, I solemnly swear to you or affirm that this is true. Now take my word for it, thank you. No, he doesn't. What does he say? He says, okay, I solemnly declare this to you, truly, truly, take it as true, and by the way, I'm gonna give you some logic. Because you need to understand that I'm not about destroying your life. I'm about making you full, making you whole, giving you a vision, giving you a future, giving you what I have planned for you. But it's not gonna be on your facsimile, it's gonna be on mine. So when you come to me and you die, you die to yourself, guess what? I'm gonna give you a life like you never could have imagined. I'm gonna blow your mind and it's all proven because I am the Logos. Proverbs 4, 18 says, the path of the just shines more and more until the full day. When you surrender your life to Christ, you're not surrendering to some uh, ethereal, uh, uh, floating vision of, well, I am surrendered and I don't know what I'm doing with my life anymore. And I thought I knew what I was going to do, but now I have no idea. No, it's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, guess what? You can't even take a breath. You don't even have a heartbeat without me every day. How dare we think that we can then get up, strap our bootstraps on and do what we want to do. Instead, He's calling us to walk in his logic, to walk in his love, to walk in his truth. And he says, fall down, fall down, fall down and die. Fall before the throne of grace and you will not be alone in life. You will be built up and flourish and you will bear much fruit. We all have struggles, disappointments, lacking, we're incomplete in our, some of our work. Um, we have shortfalls. The devil wants us to surrender to him. To say, it's not worth it. I can't give up my will. But Jesus comes and says, didn't you know? Don't you understand? You're already dead in your sins. I've got the win-win. I've got the opportunity that you need. Because I'm risen from the dead, and I'm coming to you to raise you to life, because your life, if you acknowledge and understand that you are already dead, then you will be dead in me, and the bondage of your will by the devil who takes what you want to do, your little facsimile, and says, this is your life, don't let it go, that is going to be broken. And that shell of that seed of your life, of what you're holding on to, is going to be smashed through, and you are going to be released to bring forth godly fruit. Turn to Colossians 2 with me, if you might. Now, Colossians 1 is talking about the preeminence of Christ, the Logos, meaning that the reason Paul wrote Colossians, the, uh, the church at Colossae, is because he wanted them to fix themselves upon Jesus and not upon other, any other thing. There were certain Judaistic tendencies, there were certain pagan tendencies, and all these things were warring against the early church. And so Jesus comes in and says, no, 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 stop. Time out. Look to Jesus. Paul calls us to look to Jesus Christ because it says in verse 16 of chapter 1, by the way, for by him were all things created that were in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. 
and, bef- and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, come to Colossians 2, and we understand, okay, well, wait a minute now. If by him all things exist, then who are we? We are called by God's people to be absolutely surrendered for that calling of being sur- uh, totally in. Totally in with Christ. It says, um, all things were created by him and for him. So, it's one thing to, to acknowledge that, yeah, Jesus made me. Yeah, Jesus loves me. Yeah, Jesus died for my sins. I, I understand that. I believe it. Do you know that that's basically what the demons believe? Until you're all in. Until you surrender. Every part. You haven't had faith. Because faith, the whole definition of faith, is belief plus trust. It's not just belief. Paul made that very clear. The demons tremble. They believe in God, and they tremble. But they're still demons. But we, his people, are called to believe and to trust in faith. Now, I probably, forgive me if I've done this before, but there's a visual example of faith that you may have heard about. And it's involved in a chair. Has anybody heard this or seen or did, did I do this before? Okay, there's a few of you. Now look, let me, let me just watch. Okay, hold on to me one second. Hold, hold on. This is a chair. Now contrary to David Hume, who was a false philosopher of pagan literature, it actually exists and it actually is a chair. Okay? So we can say in the tangible real world, this is a chair. Do you believe that's a chair? Is there anybody here, please, that doesn't believe it's a chair? (laughs) Play with me here. Okay, good, good. Now, now that we know that we have rationality, meaning we are not, you know, a little bit off kilter here, we all understand that it's a chair. We all believe it's a chair. And it's a wonderful chair, yes. And then a mighty chair, maybe. Can probably hold some good weight. It's a a saving chair if you're tired. Provides rest for the weary. It gives you some relaxation and enjoyment, maybe. It's all nice and good. You all believe that, right? Sure, we believe that. We've never used it, have we? Still sitting there. See, until you come to Jesus and you die to yourself and you trust Him entirely, you don't know truly the trust of Jesus. You can believe, but until you also trust Him, that's what faith is. And so, when we come to understanding of this passage of falling to the ground and dying, it's not a morbid death. It's a freeing death. It's a release to falling into the arms of Christ, to let Him use our lives, to be all in for Jesus. And that's what he says here in Colossians 2 when he says, look, I'm going to use a different version just for fun. I put it up there so you can see what I'm reading. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and those at Laodicea and for all that have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. I'm going to come back to some of these words. 
Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Sit on that chair. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, and see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. That's in Jesus. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, in regard to a festival, a new moon, or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why if you were still alive, why as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to all things that all perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in the promoting of self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, I want to end with two things, a couple things here. There is no life for us and no power over sin unless we are all in, surrendered, fully trusting in Christ, putting all of it. In fact, there's an old hymn I love that says, uh, half-hearted, false-hearted, true-hearted, whole-hearted. Okay, if you have one foot on the chair and one foot in the world, Hello? you're not. Yeah, that's a good one. Hello? <laughs> if you got one foot in Christ and one foot in the world, you're not in Christ. You have to be all in. Now, but the answer is in Christ alone. It's not in your belaboring or in uh, these things that Colossians talks about. Now the interesting thing, the thing I love about Colossians, and um, that's actually Colossians 2 verse 1. I don't know why it came up that way. But anyway, um, the thing that's wonderful is that what, what God does here in Colossians is in, in the first couple chapters, he sets down the doctrinal foundation um, called the indicatives. And then he goes to chapter 3, which are called the moral imperatives. In other words, he sets the foundation of our faith in Christ. And then he goes and tells us, therefore, don't walk in sin. Just like he said in, in, uh, in Colossians 2 to walk worthy. So he says very specifically to avoid 
these immoralities that he lists in Colossians 3. So the point that is made here is that when you die to Christ, you are going to be made alive in God and in all things empowered to serve him. That's the foundation. That you cannot even get to avoiding sin and, and, and eschewing the flesh. You can't even get there until you're all into Christ. It's by Christ alone that we have freedom from sin. It's by Christ alone that we find our life. And so once that is understood, then we walk in Him. So day by day, we have power over sin as Christians because we get up and we come to Christ. Sometimes we're a little sleepy-eyed. Sometimes we're a little slow. That's needed to, at those times we need to remember, watch out. Don't walk sleeping. Don't walk without Jesus. Okay, so then we come to this uh, instruction in chapter 2 of Colossians, which t talks about these deep, rich, full assurances that it gives us, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Look, if you want your life, you know, there's a scripture that says, there's nobody that has given up houses and lands, mothers and fathers, parents, uh, wives, children, for me, that won't get them all back. Double. Okay, that's a paraphrase, but it says that will not receive double houses and lands in this world and the next. So the point that Jesus is saying is the path of true success is the path of the cross. The path of his work in us is when we are fully surrendered to him by his grace. Then we walk with him day by day and we have the power to be successful. Don't listen to these false, foolish people who lie and say that you can have success through your disciplines. Yeah, guess what? So can anybody else who's not a Christian. But it's a fraud. The success is being all in Christ and he provides the walk of discipline not under the law which has been nailed to the cross, but under grace, which calls us to an even more holy walk because it's not a legalistic one. It goes to the heart. I love the Thomas Jefferson quote from history. It's fitting on Memorial Day. He said, I love the Jewish religion because it gives us moral codes, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, by which to live. So, but the religion of Jesus Christ is something more. Because it goes before those codes, down into the heart, and it cleanses the water at the source, and the whole life flows clean. That's pretty impressive for somebody who um, maybe wasn't the most orthodox in his faith. <laughs> But the point of that is, Christ comes to your heart, knocking, and says, are you all in? If you're not, you're not. If you are, you are. And if you are, listen up. The path of walking with me has full assurance. There it is. There's riches there. There's joy. There's absolute joy. It's not a morbid life where you have to take your little whips and watch out, oh, watch out, oh. There actually were flagellons in history. They were banned. But somehow, we still think that by our own works, we can please God. No, we cannot. Didn't start that way, won't walk that way, won't end that way. We please God through faith and faith alone. And that's where we get the riches of full assurance and the power to deny our fleshly worldly lusts. 
And then, look, it says this, make sure then as you're walking that you uh, don't let anybody delude you or make you crazy with plausible arguments. Now, I love this little, the reason why I picked this verse, this is the ESV. I'm preaching from the King James here in the, in the other passage, but the reason why I, like, I wanted you to see this is because I love the way the phraseology is, because it's, um, for, for well, <clears throat> if I were to see this in a legal brief, I would laugh out loud, LOL. I'd be reading along, I'd be like, so that no one may make you crazy with reasonable arguments. Oh, that's great. I love that phraseology. It's hilariously good. It's amazingly well said. Watch out that no one makes you crazy with reasonable arguments, with real good words. Now, I looked up the word plausible. In the Merriam-Webster dic Dictionary, it says, it's reasonably, or excuse me, superficially fair, reasonable, and valuable. But specious. You can almost hear the snake. Psst, specious. Lies. Lies. That's how bad it is. Lies. How dare we as Christians follow lies and be so easily deluded? Superficially pleasing but actually a quack. <laughs> I love these definitions. This has nothing to do with, uh, I mean, this is actually a secular dictionary explaining this word. Appearing worthy of belief, the argument was both powerful and plausible or reasonable. This is the word of God. Everybody, children, young people, adults, listen to this. Don't be deluded with powerful and reasonable arguments. In other words, when people come to you and say that there's a path of wisdom and knowledge apart from the hidden treasures of Christ, be warned, they're lying. They're completely lying. And this has happened practically in my life. Um, in the past, I've had men come up to me and say, you're apostate if you don't follow the law. I was like, excuse me? Uh, before we get started on the law, could you explain what you mean by apostate? I was probably uh, 12, okay, so I'm learning these words. I said, well, apostate means a, a, a Christian, fallen, fallen Christian, possibly even not a Christian. It's like, well, which is it? Well, if I'm in Christ, you can't fall away. So it must be a fallen Christian who has lost all the benefits of Christ and is is uh, going to not receive the, the pretty crown in heaven uh, to the great extent that God had planned. Now, I knew immediately in my spirit it was a lie that this man was coming in to my life apart from my parents, apart from my church, and was telling me that I had to adhere to a Judaistic code of the Old Testament to a degree that the Apostle Paul had said was nailed to the cross. Thankfully, my dad had preached Colossians to me, and I immediately was alerted. Now, that doesn't mean that I was antinomian and had thrown off the law. Antinomian, kids, means that you don't follow laws, okay? What it means is that my righteousness, my faith, and my growth in Christ has nothing to do with the law. But in Christ, I am motivated to do what is right. And the law is an instruction. Gives you some indication of, of how God thinks things are right and wrong. Especially, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are wonderful things. The Ten Commandments, is, uh, they're so clear. You can't get them wrong. It's wonderful. But I'm not going to be successful by getting up and saying, I will, I will, I will not do this today. No. I'm successful in Christ when I get up and say, God, apart from you, I am going to violate the law. Help me, oh God, I want to walk in you. Give me the power and strength to do what is right today. And he will, and he does. So don't be deceived by these reasonable, plausible arguments. I think about uh, who who's, uh, enjoys Pilgrim's Progress? 
Yeah. If you ever get a chance, there's a movie that was done by a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church. And it's rather well done. Um, I think Liberty University may have helped fund it. I don't know entirely. But it was rather well done because I, um, they, they actually played out. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. And it's, it's acted out. It's, very, it's, it's rather, it's kind of like a B plus. You know, it's not like Hollywood completely, but it's rather good. And, you know, it's got these characters in there. Plausible's one of them. They come to you, and they look the part, they speak the part, and they have very strong arguments to show you why they are the part, and you better listen up. But they're liars. So, watch out for that. Then as we walk with him, look what it says, God makes us alive together with him. God makes us alive together with him. When we are raised from the dead by Christ, when you die, when you recognize the death that you have apart from Christ, and then you surrender your little seed, your life, he raises you with him in the power of God. If you haven't, just as a little side note here, this passage is for the baptized. Do you see that? Verse 12. Well, it's for everybody. But listen up those who are unbaptized. The scripture says that part of the example that we show forth is that we obey the call to baptism to show forth our connection with Jesus. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with obedience to show forth the glory of God. And you see there it says that we are buried with him in baptism. Now, if you've been baptized before and you didn't realize that when you were making that public statement, you were, you were declaring, I am all in, and I want the church to know, I am all in. I am dead. I am buried with Christ in baptism. Then you might have a need to, to realize that's what God's calling us to. So when you think of your baptism, think of it that way. Wow, that's what it is. It was declaring, I'm all in. And then you're raised as you come up out of that water. Just as Christ was raised. And we're made alive together in him. Because we were already dead in our sins. And then look, he sets aside the legal demands of that debt that we owe God. The law creates a debt. No one of you can pay. And Christ set it aside, nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. And I love that one. He, he, he does a military roundup. He disarms rulers, authorities, puts them to open shame and triumphs over them. And then listen to this. Let no one disqualify you with asceticism. This is the final point here. What is asceticism? In the scripture, it says to die. Now, let me tell you something that's a problem in the church. The church, and some of them are flat out blatant about this, say that in order to show your wisdom in Christ and your obedience to scripture and your walk with God, that you have to have outward signs such as X, Y, Z, whatever they may be. I remember... Uh, my dad was invited one time to speak at a Mennonite conference and it was a wonderful experience because I'd never been among them and so we went up there and they were lovely people and there were some, even some Amish in the back and I was just having a gay old time I was just enjoying myself meeting some young men that were really nice we were running through the woods and then we sit in there for the sessions because my dad was going to, to speak on homeschooling and they wanted to hear about this homeschooling and we're, spe we're sitting in there, and I'm looking around, and I, I look at my family, and we're all modest and simple. You know, we're, we're not dressed in evening gowns and suits. It's a, it was a camp. Uh, but then I look around the room, and I'm thinking, oh, there's a stark difference here. How do we get in here? Goodness gracious. 
we're not, we didn't get the memo. And everybody that talked to us kind of was friendly, but then you'd see this little glint in their eye. Shoop. Hi, nice to meet you. You're not one of us, are you, is the way we felt. However, at the same time, they were lovely people. I want that to be very, very clear, so I'm not putting down um, the Mennonites. They are dear, dear people. But there is a problem, because as I was sitting there, guess what happened? A fiery Mennonite preacher stood up, and he said, he preached on similar verse, unless you surrender all, you're not in Christ. And he said, this means all worldliness must be set aside. You must give up drinking Pepsi. And when he said those words, I knew he was not of God. He was one of these disqualifiers that wanted to subvert. And this is what asceticism is. And this is why I want to take you to this passage as an end, because a lot of Christians get this confused. They think that dying to self means that you need to then do some great sacrifice that denies the rest of your life. And that's a truly wonderful heart, but it's not God's plan. God's plan is obedience. And he says, watch out lest you fall into that kind of thinking because it's called asceticism. And this just jumped out at me this morning and I was just so thrilled. I thought, whoa, Colossians 2 actually has this, um, King James calls it will worship. Okay, now what is it? Well, they have the appearance of wisdom promoting self-made religion and asceticism which requires severity to the body. You do this, you do this, you wear this, you have the tassel this long, you do all of these things to show your obedience to Christ, and that is all lies. It has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has everything to do with Satan's attempt to subvert the gospel inside the church. And here's what we need to be aware of. What is asceticism? Here's the dictionary def. Ascetic means relating to or having a strict and simple way of living that avoids physical pleasure. Practicing strict self-denial as a measure of personal and especially spiritual disciplines. Austere in appearance, manner, or attitude. And the Bible declares and Christ declares that these are appearances, but they have no value in stopping your sin. No value. Completely powerless. God forbid, young people, that you give your life to an appearance of piety while the sin rages and you're powerless to stop it. God forbid. And this is very important. It's very important. Because if you are all in, this is what it's talking about. You're not all in if you're all on you. You're only all in if you're all in Christ. And so I, I don't want to be too severe in a warning of uh, somberness because this is a joy. This is our freedom. This is our release. It's not a ticket to licentiousness, no way. The Mennonites like to preach that, and I'm being flat out honest. They would, Mennonite brethren would come up here and would tell you that what I'm saying is licentious. And it's important though that we get back to Christ, that we focus on the scripture, and that we instead embrace the cross of Jesus Christ, which is our success. Jesus Christ says this, truly, truly, it's a promise, logically given to you. Unless you fall to the ground and die, you will be alone. But if you die, you will bear much fruit. You will be filled 
this life and in the life to come. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord God, I pray that the power of your word would enter into the hearts and minds and guard our hearts and minds in Christ. And Lord God, that you would, by your sovereign love and grace, that you would establish us in faith and that, Father, that we would obey you with a whole and true heart and that we would be walking with you in truth by the power of the gospel and not in asceticism or in will worship, thinking that we somehow can make ourselves pleasing to you because we can. not We recognize that that is what surrender is. Until we surrender our desire and will, thinking that we can somehow please you, that we can't begin to do that. But when we surrender to you, you will take our lives. You will fax us back. After we sign the blank page, a life filled to overflowing with abundant fruit, and we will never, ever, ever be alone. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.